All right, we're going to get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We hope everyone's able to stay cool and finding some way to get a little relief from the unusual heat in May. And as we are nearing the end of the school year, this is a topic uh, today talking about the caring for the mental health of our children as America reopens and summer camps and preschools and different businesses all start to open in some capacity. So the question really has been on many people's minds, how do we transition in successfully? How do we help our children and their mental health transition into what is an incredibly unusual time and, and very potentially stressful for our young people as well? So how do we help them in our best capacity? And we have an incredible panel today giving us uh, really some words of wisdom as to how we can best do that. I'm going to go through our introductions in a moment. My name is Nicole Willier fenton I am with the Continuing and Distance Education Department at the University of Vermont. We're going to go over development, transitions, and mental health, transitions in the pandemic, guiding principles for reopening, preparing your child for reopening, no matter what capacity that looks like, even if it's going to get a haircut, how can you help to support them as they come into an unusual and uncertain situation? Sitting with that uncertainty, strategies for coping, helpful resources. We always try to leave our webinars with a, a lot of resources for everyone, and we will also follow up with this webinar with those resources as well. So if you didn't catch them throughout the presentation, we are recording this and we will share those resources post-webinar as well. And we also have a really exciting opportunity. We started with this uh, a previous webinar. It's a digital badge opportunity for your continued learning for what you have learned today, a digital badge for your participation. And I'll explain a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to uh, share some introductions today. Our panelists are very gracious to spend their time. As we know, it's a very busy time for everyone as they're juggling work and family responsibilities. Dr. Uh, Larry Shelton joins us from the University of Vermont, an Associate Professor of Human Development and Family Studies and areas of expertise, developmental ecology, lifespan development, family systems, and divorce and repartnering. And he's going to really walk us through some of those transition opportunities. Larry, we're so happy to have you here today. Also joining us is Dr. Andrea Green. She is a pediatrician at the University of Vermont's Children's Hospital, Pediatric Primary Care, and a professor of pediatrics and general pediatrics and immigrant and refugee health healthcare is also an area of expertise. Dr. Green, we are so thankful that you're taking time out of your day to be with us today. And joining us for a second time, we're so happy to have Dr. Rosenfeld joining us again to talk about adolescents and, and child psychiatry and, and how we can support them from their own mental health. Dr. Rosenfeld is a child psychiatrist at the Vermont Center for Children, Youth, and Families and an assistant professor at the Larner College of Medicine. Thank you all of you for your time today. I would like to dive in um, in just a moment. I want to go through a few logistics. I'm monitoring the questions in the comments and I will do my best to get those questions over to our panelists today. We may not get to all of them as this is probably a very, top, uh, very timely topic and lots of things that are on your mind. We will do our best to answer as many questions. Also, team members on our side will be sharing the links that you may see in the presentation. We are recording the presentation, so all of this will be shared out afterwards. So I'd like to then turn back to our presentation and start with uh, Larry Shelton. I want to start thinking about that there is no playbook here. And you and I talked a lot about that th this is very challenging for everyone and challenging for parents is to know how you support children as we start to go back into things that look very different from when they left essentially. So Dr. Sheldon, I'd like to start with you. Can you walk us through a little bit of your background and also the information that you have here about transitions and how we can support the mental health of our children? Certainly. Thanks, Nicole. And Hello, everyone. Thank you for turning, tuning in, and welcome to this discussion on how to support and protect our children's mental health as we gradually reopen and continue to cope with the coronavirus. As a developmental psychologist, I approach this situation by combining both ecological and developmental perspectives. In this framework, we think about how children and adults are always developing, 
and development always takes place in an ecosystem. Development happens because we constantly explore the ecosystem and that we are in and that try to understand it and learn the skills that are needed to participate in it confidently. We adapt to changes in our ecosystem, including learning about new settings we enter and gradually becoming comfortable in them. This is what we're all doing all the time, children, adolescents, and adults. Adaptation, which we're always doing, takes time and energy, and it's always stressful. Even if we're adapting to something that is desirable, like becoming a parent or getting married or winning the lottery, and from this developmental ecological perspective, mental health means understanding the ecosystem and having the skills necessary to participate competently, knowing how to behave, have comfortable relationships with people, manage emotions, and feel secure and able to adapt. And from this perspective, when we don't understand what's going on or know how to behave or how to do what's appropriate, or don't have comfortable relationships with people, we feel anxious. And when we feel anxious, we either try to change the environment, or protect ourselves, or get out of the situation. Mental health means being able to adapt to changes and learn to be comfortable and competent in our environment. That's what all of us are trying to do, including our children. Our responsibility as parents in any situation is to help and support our children's development and their mental health by helping them explore the environment and understand it, learn the skills needed to be competent, manage their emotions, adapt to change, and feel secure. All of that, of course, is very easy to say, but it's a really big job. It's not always easy to carry it out. It's particularly difficult if we don't understand the environment or have the skills to deal with it, or if we're sick or stressed or tired or overwhelmed by our other responsibilities. And it's also a complicated job because children are not all the same. They differ in the ways they explore the environment, how quickly they understand it, how skilled they become, how easily they adapt to change, and how much support they need. And while we're thinking about parents and children, it's important to consider that we as parents are part of the ecosystem children are trying to understand. And they, the children, are part of the ecosystem we're trying to understand. We're learning from each other and learning about each other. And we're all trying to figure out how to create and participate in a place like home that is safe and comfortable and where we know what's happening. Children are always learning from us, from the way we manage situations. So developing our own understanding and managing our own emotions and behavior are important tools for us to have. Our children need safety and a sense of security, guidance and support for their understanding of what's going on, and empathy, someone to care about and try to understand what they're experiencing. So if we look at what children are experiencing, as we're trying to adapt to, our change, to the changes in our ecosystem, it's likely that they're experiencing some version of what we as adults are experiencing as we try to cope with the many unexpected changes we've been through. Our children have experienced changes in their ecosystems and they're trying to understand and adapt to them. For them, there have been losses, losses of some of the comfortable places they're used to, childcare programs, school, playgrounds, sports teams, friends and relatives' homes, movie theaters, all of those. And they've likely experienced changes in some of their comfortable relationships relationships with their teachers, child care providers, coaches, extended family. They've lost some of their comfortable and satisfying roles. They've been students, play buddies, helpers, 
teammates, grandchild, and all kinds of other roles that they're not able to play now. The places that have changed include home. The pattern of daily life has changed. They may have parents or other family members working at home or unemployed at home. Older siblings home from college. They have parents trying to fill the role of homeschoolers. And the people at home are likely to be experiencing more stress and having difficulty adapting. So the safe and secure place for children that they're used to has been changed. And for many of those children, we know that those places are no longer safe and secure because of the tension, because of the difficulty of adapting and the difficulty of setting up new patterns of behavior. Our ecosystems have changed suddenly and in many different ways. Part of our difficulty with what has changed in our ecosystem is because we didn't have much control. The changes were unanticipated, unprecedented, and stressful. We're all still spending time and energy adapting. We didn't have much time to anticipate when coronavirus hit. We couldn't prepare ourselves or our children for changing our work or the closing of schools. We've been playing catch up and it's been very stressful. The future will be different. Reopening will be a series of additional changes for adults and for children. But with reopening, we can anticipate, plan, and prepare for the changes. We have some control over how rapidly we engage in new settings. We can keep the changes we have to adapt to manageable. We can go slowly. We'll need time to adapt to the changes. We can try to keep our current comfortable routines, such as they are, together as much as possible. We can think about what changes are necessary or desirable, how the risks might increase for us, for our children, and for others in our social circles. We can learn and help our children adapt. So on this slide, we see the things that we can do to help our children through this period, hopefully a long period of reopening. The first principle is helping our in helping our children anytime is to take care of ourselves. We can't be effective parents if we get sick. For all of us, children and adults, adapting to change takes time and energy, as I've said, and it's stressful. So as parents, we need to know how to manage our own stress and how to help our children manage theirs. We can educate ourselves about what's to come and how to stay safe in each setting that we're likely to re-enter. We need to understand the situation so we can help our child understand. We can think about our child's personality and ability to understand and cope with change. How will our child respond to changes in the routine? And how will our child enter into a new setting or a place where we haven't been in several months? We know our children so we can anticipate how they're likely to respond in those situations and how their natural responses may be a problem for us or for them. We can prepare and we can plan. Think about what we'll need to know in those situations and how we'll explain them to our children. Here it will be important to know in, and to remember that children also come in different ages. What and how a four-year-old can understand and anticipate is much less than we expect from a 14-year-old. So we have to keep our explanations and our expectations consistent with the child's abilities to understand. We can discuss new settings with our child and practice new behaviors that will be needed. We can talk about potential changes with our children. What will happen? How we'll want to behave? We can make sure our children understand, ask them what will be different how to keep everyone safe. And we can rehearse what we'll be doing that's different. Practice putting on our masks, washing our hands, disinfecting. We can discuss what we'll do if something happens that makes us feel uncomfortable. 
a person we don't know getting too close, getting teased for wearing a mask, being invited to play with a group of children whose health we don't know. We can monitor our children's sense of security and comfort. It will be helpful to try to keep home as a safe and comfortable place and gradually add other safe and comfortable places to our ecosystem. If home is safe and comfortable, then we can go there and talk about what we've experienced in the reopened places we visit. We can go slowly. We can monitor our own discomfort level and emotions. If we're not ready to be in a new situation, we probably can't be as helpful to our children as we need to be. And I'm sure this isn't final, but it's the end of my list. We can allow time to adapt to each change before making another. We can check to see that we and our child are comfortable and gradually add other safe and comfortable places to our ecosystem. One of the major causes of difficulty for all of us is when, and we've already experienced this last January, February, March, it's when too many changes take place and we can't adapt to them comfortably, so we get overwhelmed by them. We need to avoid that this time around. I'd like to finish with some thoughts about the effects of this pandemic on our development. First, it's pretty clear that the generation of children we're caring for now are going to be the most informed, knowledgeable generation ever in their understanding of disease, contagion, and public health. And that will serve all of us well in the future. Second, as parents, this situation gives us opportunities to teach our children to be aware of their surroundings and their actions, to set boundaries for themselves and others, and to express their feelings appropriately. Those are goals we have as parents anyway. We have some new and challenging opportunities to push those goals. And finally, this experience is giving all of us an opportunity to practice being responsible to others, to be empathetic with each other, and to build community. We're all in this together. And I look forward to our discussion after the next two presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for those wonderful parting words as well, just to think about um, the opportunity as well that we have here um, to teach ourselves and our young children as well. Um, I find this really fascinating too. We're going to move over to Dr. Andrea Green, is how we rely on our pediatricians, you know, for well visits and if there's an injury or an illness. Um, I would imagine many people are also turning to you to ask questions about mental health and how do we support our children um, as we consider summer camps or going back to preschool. There's so many questions that we parents are having and, and so pediatricians are such trusted advisors in this time in, in a matter of our children and their mental health as well. So I would imagine you're getting lots and lots of questions coming at you related to this as we transition back in. So Dr. Green, I'd love to toss over to you um, to hear what your thoughts are and then the information that you're presenting to us today. Great. Thank you very much and thank you for all that wonderful information about transitions. It, it's, it's really so true. I'm going to talk a little bit about information because I think one of the things um, just to start out with is to discuss a framework for reopening because I think information helps us so much if we have some sort of understanding and framework to work from in quelling some of those anxieties and then having um, knowledge that we can share with our children. So I understand that not everybody's from Vermont, that we've got people from other states, um, but I'm going to talk about Vermont quite a bit, it's a little bit Vermont centric. Um, however, these principles in these frameworks and this guidance um, really applies regardless of what state you find yourself in. So in Vermont, over the past few weeks, our governor, um, Phil Scott, has been outlining the phases of starting to reopen our economy. And he's really done that based on five principles. Um, and he's included the Department of Health in those principles. And a lot of pediatricians actually have been part of this guidance, which is um, neat to know. So we've been keeping our eyes on the data. And in Vermont, currently, as of last night, there are no COVID-19 patients in the hospital. 
um, none at all. And less than one in a hundred people, so less than one percent of people who are being tested, and we're testing a lot more people now, um, are testing positive for COVID-19. So it's important when we think about that environment to understand that in our current environment, as we reopen, we have very, very low incidences of COVID-19. And I think that's um, really important for helping to manage our anxiety. The healthcare readiness that we've had, um, that other states have had, all of that is still in place as we do this. And we are doing increased testing and tracing with lots of pop-up testing that's happening now. And the governor's really working from a work smarter, work safer, play smarter, play safer um, idea. And in general, um, all the guiding principles that we have been using are still there. And I think that's another important thing as we talk about adaptation and difficulty with transition, that the things that we have been holding on to as important are still important. And I think that helps us to not feel like you don't have to learn a whole new set of something. Those principles that you've learned over the past few months are still the principles that we want to keep. So we're moving from a stay home, stay safe to a be smart, stay safe. And we are still therefore going to be having people wear cloth masks when they go outside. We're still going to be practicing hand hygiene where you wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water. We're still encouraging physical distancing of six feet. And we're still encouraging people to stay home if they're sick and call their health care provider in addition to encouraging lots and lots of testing so we know what's going on in our community. And so these are the principles that are really helping us to understand, and I think they're the principles regardless of your state. So what does this mean for healthcare? So one of the things we want people to recognize is that um, we are still, your physicians, still here for you. We are still here to provide you with regular healthcare. And one of the things that's been really important during this time is we want to make sure that children are getting the well care that they, they should get, and especially the immunizations. We don't want there to be an outbreak of anything um, that could be prevented by immunizations, and we want to make sure that your children are fully protected. But in an effort to try and allow people to stay home, um, we are doing telehealth, whether you're doing that with a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a pediatrician, a family doctor, about 60% of visits um, are now via phone or video. And this can work really, really well for families, and it's been particularly helpful for emotional and behavioral challenges that families are experiencing. So call your physician if you are having a lot of stress in the family, and we really have um, a great way to allow you to stay home but still talk to you and, and often face-to-face -face like we're doing now, work through some of those issues. So um, important to know that that's there. And I think that will continue through this pandemic and beyond the pandemic because families have really found it helpful. Pediatric offices have put in place a lot of safety measures to eliminate any exposure. So if you do need to come into the office because, let's face it, people still get stomach aches and appendicitis and heart attacks, all of these things are still happening despite coronavirus. We don't want people to not seek health care because they're afraid. Um, or that they worry that they'll burden the system. We are here and we are here for you if you need us. So what we've done in our office and other offices have done similar things is that if you are coming in for those immunizations in a well child care check, we actually only see well people for half the day. And we only see people who are sick for the other half. So there's no intermingling of people who are sick and people who are well. And if you're coming in because you're sick, you are going immediately back into an exam room. So there is no waiting in a waiting room. Everyone is wearing masks. You are, your child if they're old enough and able to, all the staff including the receptionist. So the environment is a really safe environment and that's important for you to know. The other thing that's important to know is that your doctor's office can provide you with a lot of supports and resources. So right now, we are very concerned for families having additional stress, and it definitely plays into mental well-being of children and parents around loss of jobs, having less money for rent, having less money for bills, having less money for food. And so again, we are a place that can connect you to those resources as a, something like 211. We have wonderful social workers who can really support you through the process of getting needs met um, because we know that reducing your stress around economic issues really helps to improve the mental health of the whole family. So we are here for you for that. So please call if your child is sick 
with anything like coronavirus, that fever, cough, runny nose, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of taste or smell, but also if they're having those symptoms that can be about coronavirus, but maybe not be so obvious, things like excessive worry or sadness, unhealthy eating or sleeping, difficulties with attention or concentration because of the stress of the quarantine or the stress of the reopening. I want to talk a little bit about child care, summer um, and after school programs. These are programs that have been closed except for essential workers, but as of June 1st in Vermont, so next Monday, they're going to be opening. Um, not all of the centers are reopening, but if they're able to do all of the safety measures, they will be reopening. And from a developmental standpoint, there's some really big benefits for children um, to go back into these programs. And that is that they reestablish in-person nurturing connections that they may have known before and that were really important to them. It allows them to reestablish routines and structure. And we know that routines and structure are really helpful for children as far as their mental well-being. And it allows them to keep um, rebuilding or enhancing their social emotional skills. So although you may have anxiety about children going back into these situations, there's some real, real benefits for them. So what's the reopening guidance in Vermont? And again, if you're in another state, it will be very similar to make sure that your children are safe going back into these environments. So in Vermont, um, programs are, being, uh, are having to follow some health department detailed guidance. And I've just summarized a little bit for you here on the slide. Um, and again, there is much more detailed guidance you can get. And I have that information through our resources if you're interested in knowing things in more detail. But in Vermont, um, staff will be required to wear cloth masks. Children over two, it will be encouraged. Again, not all children are developmentally able to do that, so it's just going to be encouraged. And children under two will not be required to wear masks. Groups are going to be limited to about 25 people, and they won't mix. So the idea is to have the staff and the children stay together so there's not a lot of exposure to a lot of other people. And wherever possible, they're going to have that physical distancing happen. So that will be like in lines or for nap time, or if they're doing a table activity, they'll have children further apart. So they're going to be keeping all of that framework that we talked about in the beginning in place as much as possible. They're going to have kids outside more and a lot more fresh air circulating in buildings as well. Drop off and pick up times will happen in a staggered fashion, and ideally have the same person who's doing drop off and and pick up, and that person has to be healthy and not obviously in quarantine, and there'll be hand hygiene stations that'll be set up as children enter these programs. Children will have daily health checks, and if they have a fever over 100.4 Fahrenheit or 38 degrees centigrade, or any symptoms of COVID, if they've been in contact with someone um, who has COVID-19 and um, within a 11 to 14 day period, they will not be able to attend or if they're being tested and waiting for results. Um, and some kids who have high risk medical conditions, it might not be recommended. And again, that's something to talk to your pediatrician about if you're concerned. As far as schools and going back to schools, as you know, um, pretty much everywhere in the country, um, schools are closed until the end of 2019, 2020 for in-person education. And so remote learning is going on. And that is a huge challenge for families, as we know. Um, graduations and lots of the transition rites that are supposed to happen are not being able to happen, although in Vermont drive-up celebrations, happening I think at our one drive-in movie theater for all these different kids, um, will be happening. And so people are trying to be really creative and come up with virtual ways to allow these celebration, celebrations of transitions to happen. And next fall is really unknown. And this, when I talk to kids in my office, has been a a big piece of stress. The kids who are transitioning to college don't know if they should do it if it's virtual and spend that money. Kids that are transitioning from middle school to high school are feeling really anxious about what that's going to mean for them. And kids um, who find learning distantly, remotely, virtually very challenging for them are very anxious about having to do that for a longer period of time. They're missing their friends. But there are some things that schools can do, and schools are really trying to figure out how to reopen. Um, and so measures are being put into place. And you can talk to your kids about this. Um, they're really working to make sure that they can make the school setting safe, that they've got um, disinfectant and sanitization procedures in place, that they can screen and monitor and test for illness in staff and students, um, that they'll have masks and other supplies that they might need. 
um, and that they are able to um, intermittently close schools if there is an outbreak or something that needs to happen. So all of that is really being worked on as this moves forward. So you can tell your children we don't know, but people are working on it and everybody is trying to get kids back into school and back into school safely. So how do you prepare your children for the reopening that's happening right now and the reopening that we're still waiting for? And we heard some of this from um, Larry, so I won't go into it maybe in so much detail because he gave us some great ideas. But what I always like to think about is thinking back to a transition that happened already. So that first day of school or um, that first day of daycare, whatever it was, that first day of camp last summer. How did you feel about it as a parent? How did your child feel about it? What were those emotions you had? Because you have experienced that already. That is a transition that happened in the past and you can draw from that experience to help you with these transitions that are happening now. And, and if you were like me, those transitions had a lot of mixed emotions. I, especially right now, I've had a lot of mixed emotions about having my now grown children come home and how wonderful it is and how hard it's going to be for me to have them leave again when they go back to their jobs and to college and all these other things. So, so as much as it can be stressful, there's also these benefits and there's this separation that's going to happen. So talk through those emotions and practice these new routines. Um, practice sort of, you know, what drop off might look like. Um, practice what washing your hands as you enter a child care center might look like. Practice ways to share and care where you're not whispering or you're not um, hugging. Um, practice wearing that mask as Larry talked about and practice smiling with your eyes because as Dr. Ritu told us and um, he's one of the other UVM psychiatrists, we actually really smile with our eyes much more than with our mouth. So if we're wearing a mask covering our mouth, we have our eyes showing. And so practice smiling with eyes and talk to kids about that so that they know they can still express their emotion and be friendly even if they have a mask on. And maybe those air hugs or those foot taps or whatever we're going to do to greet our friends. Switch sides, please. So we want to remember that there's opportunity in pandemic. And this is a really busy slide, but, but it gets at the fact that there's an opportunity to build resilience in our kids. And we have this instinct to protect and shelter and avoid hard things and painful things for our children, but it's really in tackling challenges that our children build confidence and resilience and the skills that they need to navigate their whole life. And so this is one opportunity of many opportunities where they'll have to adapt and deal with transitions and deal with unknown things. And so we can model support and notice the strengths that they're exhibiting to help them recognize their resilience and give them that can-do attitude. And these are um, wonderful um, little uh, sort of response and, and, and flipping those negative emotions that some of us are experiencing into positive opportunities to model and teach lifelong resilience skills. So this is from um, a healthychildren.org article that's again in your references and I highly recommend it um, because it, it really does help us put ourselves in the right place to help support our children. Um, to grow through this pandemic. And I'll leave it at there. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you for raising that point, too, in terms of um, some of the benefits of coming back into camps and, and school care programs and, and daycares and preschools, because I think as parents, we've been weighing, do I send them back um, in safer home, mentally, physically? You know, what are those different opportunities? And it's a lot to try to figure out. And so that really gives some perspective as to some of the benefits for our children and how resilient they are and competent they are. And so there is some opportunity again there. So thank you so much for that. We are getting a few questions. I'm going to pause um, on the questions just for now. We're going to, because I think um, probably Dr. Rosenfeld may help with some of the um, mental health over loss as well. There, that is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, and how do we support uh, children, specifically since we're talking about young children today, um, with loss during this uh, of, of family members or friends or things like that. So Dr. Rosenfeld, I'll toss over to you because I know you've got a lot of information, wonderful information to share with us and then we'll get to a few more questions at the end. That sounds good. Thanks, Nicole. I'm just uh, amazed at uh, how used to I've gotten seeing people I know as little boxes with their names on it and a screen, how normal that's become, all this loss and uncertainty and change. There's, it reminds me of when we had smartphones and just pops up and says, mom is calling and now I've forgotten everybody's actual phone numbers. I'm worried that after the pandemic ends, I'm gonna forget people's names when they're not in a little box right under their screen. 
really nice to hear what Larry and Andrea said. It's uh, so much helpful advice for me as a parent. And I'm going to turn toward, uh, as a psychiatrist, sort of the internal ecology of uh, our minds and our bodies as we go through this time of incredible uncertainty and change. And as Larry pointed out, there's a little more predictability coming up as we get some guidelines rolling out with the changes from the governor's office, from pediatricians, from our trusted advisors. And still alongside that, there's a lot of uncertainty about what that's going to feel like and how it's going to go. So I'll try and spend a few minutes and a few slides talking about how to prepare for uncertainty, if that's possible, how to anticipate uh, the unexpected. And I thought starting place might be with the word itself. So pandemic, where does that come from? Pan means all, everything. And demos is, uh, and the origin is meaning people. So we're talking about something that's affecting all the people. And a couple of the presenters, and I think Nicole, you mentioned as well, the flip side of this tragedy is that it's also uniting. We're all in this together. I think that's been kind of a meme that's circulated of the connectivity that this reveals in terms of everybody facing challenges related to the same source of this pandemic. So as we keep in mind all the difficulties that this brings up for us, I want to also keep in mind the uh, potential growth that we can have as individuals, as families at every level of the ecosystem. So sitting with uncertainty, not an easy task, and there's uncertainty across pretty much the full spectrum of who we are, what we do, the roles, changes that Larry mentioned, not just for adults and their jobs and uh, parenting and family roles and as caregivers, but also for our kids and their roles as friends and how they play together, what they can do together, and what their role as a student looks like. So I appreciate that there's some mention of how much there is out of control and looking toward what we can control. And sometimes we need reminders of what we can take control over. So. I like to think of this as spaghetti western coping. The spaghetti westerns were a few flicks made by Clint Eastwood and company where they went over to Italy to film inexpensively and made some westerns that became classics, one of which is called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So Good, Bad, and The Ugly, spaghetti western coping is kind of a nod to the fact that amidst all this uncertainty of our lives now, we're all going to have moments and days and weeks that we may experience some good feelings, some bad feelings, and plenty of ugly feelings. And there isn't any one coping strategy or mechanism or thing to do that's going to work for all of them or that's going to work for all the people in this pandemic. So this is sort of an invitation to consider really the internal ecology of what's going on in our minds and bodies and to recognize, to bring some awareness to, is this a good moment? Is it a bad moment? Or are we getting kind of ugly here? And to think about sort of how we recognize those and how we might shift our coping strategies or even prepare for those moments because they're probably all going to come up at some point, if not many times over the course of the day. And the invitation part, too, is to notice that this is a uh, suggestion. None of these are meant to be particular to any person. Uh, so take what you can from this. If there's one thing that's useful, that would be, I would consider that a success. So kind of keeping with the pandemic uh, viral theme, I'm going to start by describing the symptoms of good, bad, and ugly moments or days or periods, and then talk about some strategies that might be relevant toward each phase of our emotional uh, uncertainty and roller coaster here. So starting with the good, what does it feel like to feel good? Um, breaking it down into what thoughts might go with that, what emotional feelings might accompany it, and also how it feels in our bodies. So some things that might come to mind, this is an incomplete list, but some of the basics might be feeling that I'm loved, feeling that I'm safe, and feeling that I can help others. And these are relevant to parents and children going through these transitions um, and they're going to feel different at different developmental stages, as Larry mentioned, but there's also some universality in terms of uh, the sense of safety or um, pleasant feelings and how that comes across in the mind and in the body. Emotions that might be experienced on a good day are contentment, satisfaction, joy, peace, anything along those lines, the kind of happy spectrum of emotions. 
And physically, it might feel like having plenty of energy, feeling alert, feeling light, feeling awake. A bad day, in contrast, or a bad moment, might get our minds spinning on, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I'm kind of lost. This isn't fair. Things keep changing. I didn't want it to be this way. This is not how I planned for my day or week or life to go. And maybe it's never going to go that way. I can't keep up with this. I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. And the emotions that can go along with that might be worry. What is this going to mean for my future? Anger. I'm so frustrated at the unfairness of this. Sadness about all the losses. And how to cope with those losses. And physically, this can feel pretty heavy sometimes. It can be muscle tension, tension really anywhere in our body, and a sense of unease. And there's the ugly, the crushingness of the ugly moments and the ugly days that we all have. And this might sound in our mind like, what's wrong with me? Life is pointless. And also sometimes it's directed at others. It's all their fault. It's all his fault. It's all her fault. This could be directed at our kids, at our parents, at our neighbors, at people outside of our communities. Somebody's messing everything up with me, or I'm messed up in the first place. Those are pretty uncomfortable thoughts to have. They can lead to feelings like shame, or rage, blame, and even hatred. And physically, sometimes this feels just kind of dizzy or disorienting, disconnected, pretty miserable. So if that's the spectrum of experiences that we all might have within the span of sometimes a few minutes in my personal experience, what can we do to draw awareness to that and to help ourselves and those around us, the children we care for, our family members, elderly that we care for, our neighbors, ourselves. So on a good day, if you're recognizing those feelings, those emotions, those thoughts going through your head, it's an opportunity it's an opportunity to help somebody else who's having a bad moment or an ugly day to who's not maybe as capable or doesn't have the resources in that moment to soothe themselves. You can be some of that soothing energy for that person. It's also a great time to create the self-care routines that will sustain you. The basics that have been mentioned about a good sleep hygiene, good sleep habits, a consistent sleep routine, nourishing yourself and your body, Having a movement routine doesn't have to be anything complicated. Maybe it's a walk or some form of moving your body, exercising, gardening, creative venues like journaling, writing, building, making music, making art, and connection. Who do you meet up with? Who do you check in with on a regular basis? Whatever your fancy is, and trying to make it daily, which I'll come back to why that's important to have it be a frequent routine. Find your flow, find the activities that punish, replenish you. When you've got that good kind of feeling energy, do the things that nourish you, that build up your resources. This, again, could be any hobby. It could be your work. It could be time with your kids, gardening, cooking, playing music, writing music, dancing, etc. Whatever it is that strikes you, where you have that sense of all my forces are working in harmony. And it, that also is inspiring to other people, and it generates energy, playfulness, ideas that can help you to take care of yourself, people around you. Feeling good is a good time to practice gratitude and notice the positive things in your life. I don't know if you can see behind me, but they just put the air conditioners in our offices today, and it's, I'm so grateful. It's such a welcome relief after the hot spell we've been having. Um, gratitude practices have been studied in randomized controlled trials, and Writing down three good things that happen during your day, usually at the end of the day, has been shown to increase happiness, not just while you're doing it, but even when they check back six months later. Pretty brief and easy kind of change to make, but a daily habit that can set your mind toward looking for the positive and feeling gratitude, that will help for the bad and the ugly moments, set you up on a more positive course. Writing a thank you note is another way to practice that or sending a text that expresses some gratitude. And lastly, it's a good time to practice mindfulness. This doesn't have to be a prolonged, seated, lotus position meditation. Uh, I, when I was thinking about this talk, I was listening to some experts talking about mindfulness, and they said, you know, as little as one minute each day counts. That's something that's building, that's practicing your mindfulness muscle. 
And I think even one moment counts if you can stop to take one breath with awareness on a good or bad or ugly day, that counts as practicing mindfulness. If you can look up at the sky and actually see it there instead of looking for something. And particularly if you can look at your loved ones, the people around us who are often involved in the good, the bad, and the ugly moments and not need to say anything or do anything, but just to be with them with eye contact. That's also can be recharging. On a bad day, naming your feelings is a great place to start. You can help them notice that there are some bad feelings happening. Any kind of journaling, there have been many studies, whether you're journaling about the future, about the past, about difficult things, about gratitude, it's really helpful to process our feelings because it shifts our mind from the emotional kind of survival part of the brain toward the frontal and prefrontal cortex where we do our self-regulation and our focusing part of the mind. And that shift, it's kind of like the Voldemort effect in Harry Potter. If you are referring to things as he who must not be named, they become frightening, they get hidden, they get wrapped in secrecy and shame and darkness. And just giving it a name already makes you feel a little bit braver and also is doing something to your neural circuitry to say, I can be in problem-solving mood, I can address this instead of being overwhelmed and frightened by it. Seeking support wisely, by which I'm implying, think about where you get support from, and if it's a person who is going to make you feel worse or question what you're doing or say, boy, you really are having a bad day and this is not looking good and you need to do something differently, that might not be so supportive but consider the people who will notice your bad day and be okay with it and say, I, I see you're struggling, who will be able to meet you. And maybe it's because they're having a good moment or a good day, but you have the right to choose where and from whom you seek support. And that can make a big difference. Stick with the routine. So the routine created in the good moments and the good days, that's your backup plan when you're having a bad day. Uh, I think this might've been a separate bullet point, but noticing your accomplishments so rather than focusing on the things that didn't go well or didn't get done during the day, actually carving time out, and this again, it can be through journaling or just talking to a partner or loved one. What did I do today? Look at all the things I did. Look at the places I made it. Kids are alive. This is a success. Also listening to someone else's troubles can remind us of that conductivity that since we're all in this together and there are other people struggling and suffering alongside me, this is a pandemic. It's affecting all the people. There's nothing wrong with me that I'm having a bad day. Ask yourself, take time to check in. Am I focusing on the important stuff? Is part of my bad feeling or bad day being driven by getting caught up in something that really doesn't matter that much to me? And then maybe replace some of that frenzy with your flow, with the activities that I mentioned before that replenish you, whatever that is, the things that fill your bucket. Practice mindfulness. If you can, one moment, one breath at a time. And lastly, the ugly moments and the ugly days. These are hard. These can feel pretty desperate. Again, choose your environment wisely. So it's relevant to avoid the people and places that might make your ugly feelings feel uglier. And to try to seek out actively the people and places that can see past your ugly feelings. And remember, that's not all of who you are. That's part of all of us, but it doesn't make up who you are or define you. And then similar to the Voldemort effect, name your feelings, share them. That does a lot to decrease uh, how much they can overwhelm or affect us. But here I added, share them with your favorite person. So the person you feel really safe talking about these kind of ugly feelings or behaviors that we all get into sometimes. Safety, so a lot of the things we do to hurt ourselves and others, physically, verbally, happen in these ugly moments. So plan in advance for that. The things that might be dangerous to you, you know yourself best or the people around you, whether that's drugs or alcohol or sharp things or pills or money, bank accounts or gambling. Try to make those things hard to access when you're having an ugly day or an ugly moment. Fall back on your routine again. At least try to keep your meal schedule and your sleep schedule and maybe make your bed every day because then you've got one thing done that feels good. And finally, compassion. So compassion is noticing when someone else is suffering, and we all are, and feeling like it's not their fault. This could happen to any of us, myself included, and they deserve help with it. And that can turn around toward ourselves to create self-compassion. This isn't my fault that I'm suffering. 
it could happen to anybody, and I deserve help with it. I like this meme. Maybe some of you have seen it circulating around. Um, but to remember, in the rush to return to normal, to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. I think we're all learning a lot from this experience. And I would close by saying there's, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of grief and loss and uncertainty happening in the pandemic, and that's going to continue. And some people will be overwhelmed by that temporarily or more long term and deserve help. And that's what psychiatrists and other helping professionals are here for through telehealth and other ways, through our primary care doctors or pediatricians, we're all part of a network to support families. Um, at the same time, it's a small percentage of people that, that meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's a much larger percentage that have growth through these experiences, or that even if they get post-traumatic stress disorder a year later, they're doing well. And many of the experiences that they describe is feeling more connected after a trauma, having a different sense of what their priorities or their purpose are, and even a different sense of their own vulnerability and strength. So there's some things that we're growing from in this experience um, that I think we'll look back on and appreciate. Thank you, Dr. Rosenfeld. Thank you so much for that, those tips and, and just grounding us in some um, gratitude and some practices that we can do. I, I must say that you, you have shared that with me previously, and that's probably my favorite part of my day is to ask my 10-year-old um, son and my 4-year-old daughter what made them happy today. And the answers are always um, interesting and unexpected and sometimes expected. Sometimes it's flowers and the cat, uh, but other times it's things that I wouldn't have expected. So that's really a fun exercise that we've been doing. So thank you for sharing that advice with us as well. We do have some questions coming in, and I, I will get through um, and share the resources that you're seeing up on the screen. One of our team members, Kelly, will also add those resource links in the comment uh, chat box on YouTube for you as well. And as I've stated, this is recorded and we will share these resources out with everybody in the post webinar also. Um, I, I have two questions that I wanted to maybe start with um, Dr. Andrea Green. There's a lot of questions that are coming about, um, about masks and with children and, and adults as well, but with asthma, with development disabilities, it, how do parents help their children navigate the masks when there may be some respiratory issues already? Yes, yeah, so I think it is important to note that masks are encouraged but they're not mandatory because for some kids it will not be possible for them to wear them. And so the hope is that by having the group around them wear masks, you know, as many people are protecting that child as possible because not everybody can wear a mask. With asthma, one of the challenges is for some people, the hot air, and you get much hotter air in when you're wearing a mask, that hot air will cause them to feel like they can't breathe or give them a little bit of a flare in their asthma. And so wearing the mask at times of the day that are cooler if they're going to go outside can be one thing that's helpful. Um, practicing inside so they get used to it for all children is helpful because it can feel quite funny. And for kids who have sensory issues, it may be that something behind the ear bothers them more than something tied. Um, with younger children, often if you put a superhero on a mask, it helps. Or if you um, do some silly, you know, sort of design or something to individualize that mask, they can feel pretty proud of it and that can help them. But it is going to take some innovation. And for people with asthma, you're going to just have to Try to be mindful of the temperature and the heat. Make sure that kids are taking all of their preventative medications, say if they're on an inhaled corticosteroid to help not have a flow, uh, to have an asthma exacerbation. Perhaps in the summer they don't usually need to take it, but it may be something in consultation with their physician that they will take if the mask is triggering a little bit for them. So I would recommend doing your best if you are having a lot of challenges and you have a particular health issue, reach out to your pediatrician or your, your family physician to, um, to talk through some of those intricacies in particular with your child. The other question that, thank you very much, the other question that we're getting a lot, and, and I've seen a little bit of this experience with my own um, early uh, younger child, um, is some regression of some behaviors. Um, and so very curious, um, any or all of you might have some perspective on this because I think parents, we have that question, um, recommendations to deal with regression with preschool age children. Um, maybe Dr. Green, maybe you want to start and then I'd love to hear from the other folks as well. Yeah, so I, I think 
often stress does bring on regression in kids, and that's not an uncommon thing to happen. And I think, um, you know, maybe sometimes even in adults, some of us regress a little bit. You know, we fear and, and unknown can not always allow us to be at that good space. So I always think the first thing, as everyone's been talking about, is to check in with ourselves. How are we feeling about that regression? Is it something that's making us more stressed out or more angry or uh, more upset in some way? And, and just recognizing to have patience for ourselves for those feelings that we're experiencing and then to have patience for the child um, for those fears. And then it's, again, just help them gradually relearn a skill that they knew before, um, create that safety and that setting for them in order to relearn that skill. And, and just be patient. They will get it back um, as much as we can, try to give them an environment that allows them to feel successful again um, and, and to grow. But I, I think the psychiatrist might have other ideas. Yeah, maybe Larry Shelton, do you want to maybe um, unmute and, and share with us some thoughts too? Because I'm almost wondering too, um, since you talked about so much transition, may we see a little bit more of that regression as we transition into this other phase of, of the pandemic and, and our own learning opportunities here? Yes, I, I, I certainly agree with Andrea. We've seen a lot of um, situations where adults are recognizing that we are regressing it's difficult when any of us is, is uh, under a great deal of stress. And I think one of the pieces of advice that's been most common across all of the, the literature and the, the postings on social media for parents are to cut the kids some slack and do the same for yourself. When you're trying to work at home and teach your kids at home, um, you, not everything is going to get dusted. Not everything is going to be as clean as it should be or, or you'd like it to be. So we all need to give ourselves permission, as, as Andy pointed out, have compassion for ourselves and for our kids. And that means accepting some regression and recognizing where it comes from, recognizing that people, including ourselves, need support, and providing the support rather than the criticism for the regression. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Rosenthal, I want to uh, kind of pivot a little bit from that question to ask a, a different one, um, a little bit of a follow-up. Um, we had a question that, that a parent is asking, how do I manage somewhat of different expectations and different challenges with the different children? Um, and so maybe one child doesn't want to go out and feels very safe at home. The other child can't wait to get out and is ready to explore. How, as a, as a, as a one-parent unit sometimes, um, can parents help to navigate those two very different attitudes that their children may be experiencing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that it's sort of stretching us thin this pandemic when that one parent who might be single parenting some of the time or all the time also may now be dealing with a lot of other jobs or stressors or keeping up with schoolwork. So I think that also, you know, thinking back on what Larry framed at the beginning about development and the uniquenesses of our kids, so I think coming back to listening first, what is the child expressing? Is this just a difference in temperament that some kids are, say, more social and gregarious and other kids are more reserved or inhibited and in honoring that difference? Or is there something behind it? As Andrea mentioned, there are a lot of fears that we get that can also be reframed. And so one technique might be to consider if there's a child who's worried about getting ill or worried about one of their peers getting ill or what if they get ill and then grandma gets sick or something related to fears around the pandemic and reopening, that might be something that can be talked through depending on the level of the child and think, well, there are ways that we're able to address that and to seek information about what's the best thing to do, which is pretty consistent in terms of hand washing and distancing physically and wearing masks and limiting the size of gathering. So kind of rehearsing those things and emphasizing hand washing for younger kids and some of the distancing for older kids. So emphasizing what they can do, what they can take control of, and also noticing your own limitations in that. There are definitely going to be some no's of like, we can't go take you to this play date with the family we've agreed to play with and take you out back to play soccer. And you know, I can only supervise so much at once. I think there is a question about um, kids having a lot fewer choices that you shared in the chat box and how to manage when kids don't get to make their own schedules and they may have to go to childcare or may have to stay home. And so I think 
the opportunity is to look for what choices you can, because some of those choices are we can't change the choices and the losses that we've had, but maybe we can make a, everybody gets to pick what's for dinner one night, or you don't get to choose now, but you get to choose the activity later and your sibling has to wait their turn. Or some sense of sharedness that we can include ourselves in of, now it's my time to choose and we're having pizza. Great, thank you very much for that perspective. I wanna um, end with one more question, but I just wanted to share, because I know our participants are learning so much from you all today, and I know I do every time I have the opportunity to do these webinars. And so, being University of Vermont, we want continuous learning for everyone who's joining us, and so there's a learn and earn, a digital badge um, for participation opportunity for everybody today. It's really a fun opportunity just to um, showcase the kind of opportunities that you have been doing to move yourself along and, and add to your own education. And so um, Kelly and our team will put up the link to request the badge. It's kind of a fun process and something that you could explore a little bit more about. Um, the last question that I just wanted to ask that I've seen um, a lot of this come up with, with parents that I know and then it's coming up in the chat box as well is when you see the images of um, some other countries that school has come back into session and you see the, the separation of the desks and the sneeze guards and the guards up during the lunch hour and we think about um, you know, early childhood education and summer camps and things like that, that won't be as severe, I think, in, in terms of the visuals that we're seeing in some other areas, um, but there will still be that disconnection, if you will. Um, and I know parents are, are wondering, how is that a, how do we go back into that and how do we help our children stay connected when there's such physical disconnection that will be happening as they re-enter into some of these places? And, and I'd really toss that out to any of you um, and then we'll wrap it up in just a minute. I don't know if maybe, um, there we go, thank you, Larry. I'll jump in on that. I think uh, one of the first things we can do is recognize the power of the technology that we have. Um, we're using it now. Kids are using it. Uh, families are using it. We're using it at work. And it can be used well for staying in touch with relatives, staying in touch with friends. Uh, my grandchildren are, are on their phones and, and on uh, Skype and Zoom regularly maintaining contact with their friends from college and from high school um, and with relatives. And I think we as parents can encourage that uh, to the extent that we have time. And we can practice it ourselves. Uh, we can take the initiative to make those contacts and let people know that we're thinking of them and we care about them and, and we're interested in what's happening in their worlds. So we can use the technology. And if we don't have the technology, we could send postcards Snail mail is still working. I'm corresponding with an eight-year-old grandchild, um, sending uh, letters back and pictures that we draw back and forth through the mail because I can't be with him uh, nearly as often as I would like to. Thank you for that. Can I add something else? Um, so one of the other things we're seeing a lot of images of is people being framed as helpers. And I think um, it's a great message to send our children because to me, Wellness is really rooted in feeling like you belong, feeling like you have purpose, and feeling like you can help other people. And so I think we can reframe things for our children as we re-enter. We can remind them part of what they're doing when they do some of these things that maybe aren't the things they want to do is they're being helpers. And that they're going to learn new ways to help, um, but they still have the opportunity to contribute and to help to keep their community healthy by doing their part and it will mean school's different, the setup of things are different, but they are helpers, just like all these other people out there are helpers, helping to keep themselves and other people well. And I think that's a powerful message to kids. It's a message of being part of a community and it's a message of wellness. Thank you for that. Dr. Rosenfeld, do you have any uh, other thoughts on how we can help our children to stay connected as they re-enter into these physical spaces together that may feel fairly disconnected? Yeah, I really appreciate what both Larry and Andrea said. I think we're finding new ways. So part of it is modeling and looking for opportunities, looking at how we as adults and as the ones who can be in the helping position that they might be looking to are figuring out how to do that, how to communicate through 
and around masks, how to reach out to people who we can't see in person, um, how to keep physically distant and still be social. Uh, smiling with the eyes is a great one that I could see practicing with kids and families. How are you going to let you know, your friend know that you like what he or she or they are doing? Let's see your eye smile. So I think kind of making it sort of gamifying it, making it fun, making it a challenge and checking in with kids about it. How did you find ways to connect with people today? How did you talk to your friends? Who found a new way that they want to share? Who wants to try this tomorrow? Kind of making it a family affair would, would benefit as well. Great, thank you. I always learn so much from all of you and I hope everyone participating today has walked away with a, a little bit more confidence as things start to open up and as we start to guide our children through this process as well. Um, Dr. Shelton, Dr. Green, and Dr. Rosenfeld, thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a very busy time for you as well, and thank you for your support for our young children and our young adults as well. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone. We will send out this uh, recording and the resources within a few days. Have a great afternoon.